Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3 and reading through verse 14. It, uh, it begins on page 1,423 in the Pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along there. Hear the reading of God's Word. We always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all God's people. When the true message, the good news, first came to you, you heard about the hope it offers. So your faith and love are based on what you hope for, which is kept safe for you in heaven. The gospel keeps bringing blessings and is spreading throughout the world, just as it has among you ever since the day you first heard about the grace of God and came to know it as it really is. You learned of God's grace from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is Christ's faithful worker on our behalf. He has told us of the love that the Spirit has given you. For this reason, we have always prayed for you ever since we heard about you. We ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, with all the wisdom and understanding that his spirit gives. Then you will be able to live as the Lord wants, and you will always do what pleases him. Your lives will produce all kinds of good deeds, and you will grow in your knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength which comes from his glorious power so that you may be able to endure everything with patience and with joy give thanks to the Father who has made you fit to have your share of what God has reserved for his people in the kingdom of light. He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of his dear Son by whom we, have set, we are set free that is, our sins are forgiven. May God bless the reading of his word. It goes without saying that life has its share of problems. Sometimes it seems that all it is is one problem, one concern, one issue after another. Sometimes it seems insurmountable. Now... When there is a problem in life, what is our natural tendency? Run screaming for the hills? If you could, I guess. But we can either focus on the problem and fixate on the problem, or we can look for or look at the solution. Figure out what the solution is. Often times, however, even though we, we say that's what we should do, our, our way of working and doing things is to focus on the problem. We get caught up in the problem. It, it's something like mathematics. Some of us love mathematics. Some of us, if given a math problem, turn pale, and that's when we want to run screaming for the hills. But that's not, that's not what we should do, is it? Look for the solution. Look at the solution. Take the information you know and go from that and, and find the solution. However, so often, we spend an extraordinary amount of time dealing with the problem or, or just throwing up our hands and saying, I can't. I won't. Why me? Why now? If we don't say it with our lips, we often think about it and think these things in our mind. The problem seems so great, how can we ever get past it? Obviously, problems can easily overwhelm us, and so it takes either an act of will or a state of mind to stop focusing on the problem and focus on the solution. Now, the letter of Colossians is a letter that deals with problems. And it seems that when we read the letter, 
So often we, we focus on, on the things that Paul says to do in order to counter the problem. Our, our goal, it seems, in doing that oftentimes is to, is to try to... Um, bye. <laughs> the, the problem... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, now I'm going to have to... In Colossians, <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> All right, there is a problem. There are several problems that, that Colossians deals with. We tend to focus on, on the problems. Scholars, in, in, in reading that I was doing this week, uh, what I found was that scholars so often, they say, we don't know what the issue exactly, what it was, uh, and, but they, they really talk a lot about the possibilities. And it dawned on me, sometimes I think maybe scholars, and this has gone on for centuries, they're hoping they're going to be the one who identifies the problem itself so that ever after everyone will say, so-and-so, figured out what the problem was that Colossians was dealing with. The beauty of the letter, however, is in what Paul is doing in the letter. He never tells us what the problem itself is. He hints at the problem. He hints at issues. But he's not focusing on the problem. Paul is focusing on the solution. The solution is Christ. And he begins with that emphasis as he is writing to the Colossians. In his greeting, he speaks of their relationship with Christ. The faith that they have, the hope that they have, the love that they have. He speaks of how this is reflected in their life. He is throughout this letter, even as he speaks of the issues, of the problems, he is never going to stray away from his focus on Christ. They, the Colossians, have found their hope for life in Christ. They have problems. They had problems prior to coming to Christ. They have the same problems that we have, some of them more acute than what we deal with. At issue so often was, will I have enough to provide food for my family and a roof over my head? If they were a slave, they might have those things, but they always have to deal with, am I pleasing my master? Will I do something that will cause them to turn on me? They also, they, they live in a world that's very familiar with the idea of the gods. Everyone lives in such a way that they are trying to please a god. Whatever god, or maybe even multiple gods. They keep offering sacrifices in order to appease the gods so that Hopefully, the gods will be favorable to them, smile upon them, give them what they need, maybe even what they want. That the gods will provide the food I need and a, and a roof over my head. If those are the most basic, if those are their concerns. Now, what happens, however, the gods are at times very fickle. One of the gods that they were encouraged to worship was Caesar, the emperor. The only thing is, is that if you happen to be close to the emperor and you're worshiping the emperor, if you do something that displeases the emperor, it can have dire consequences. To worship the emperor is, as with any other god, it's, it's rather fickle. Maybe today you've pleased them, maybe today you haven't. You're always wondering, for the gods, 
don't always seem to be able to provide. And then here is Jesus who said, you can never do enough to satisfy God. All the sacrifices that, that you could ever do are never enough to satisfy God. But you don't have to. You don't have to offer all of the sacrifices. <clears throat> Jesus has already paid that price for you. So, as a result, Jesus is the one you are to follow. Jesus is the one you give yourself to. Jesus is the one in which you put your hope. Now, that hope, that hope that Jesus is the means to provide for me, the one that can satisfy those desires, the one that can provide, the one that, that I don't have to worry if, if, if I stumble today, I will be forgiven. And he will help me, he will pick me up, and we'll start the journey again tomorrow. Peter, getting out of the boat, with a little God, when he, when he turned his eyes away from Jesus and he began to sink, too bad. Jesus reached out to him and said, Where, what happened to your faith? And they got back in the boat, and Peter continued the journey, continued to learn what it is, who it is that he is putting his hope in. That hope then is reflected in faith and in love. Now, it is, the, it is their faith in Jesus that sustains them and, and helps them. No matter what happens, as, as the prayer says, as Paul says in the, in the introduction, no matter what struggles and trials and strife you face, in Jesus, not in yourself, not in the other gods, not in anything, not even in the sacrifices that you might offer, none of that is important. It is, it is faith in Jesus. Now, faith itself, faith is a gift. You can never on your own, in your own strength, have enough faith. The attempt on your own to have faith creates another God, an idol that you will end up worshiping as you struggle and try to have faith. Faith itself is a gift. That faith, it's determined not the amount of faith we have, but the object of our faith. What is your faith in? Faith in Christ. Faith in what he has done. Faith in, in, in the revelation of God in the world with us, among us, who then became sacrifice for us. The Colossians had heard this message, they had accepted this message, and as a result, they were loving others to the point that Paul is made aware of it. They are a witness of this love that God has for us, and this witness was in their community, and others were coming and being drawn to, to the new life that is ours in Christ. As they were living that new life, it revealed itself in the love that they had for others. Now these are the things that Paul says to them. This is what he's praying about for them. And he's praying that you will continue in these foundational things that you first learned. Yes, I said there are issues, there are problems. There are problems that, that as the believers are walking in faith, there are now teachers among them who are teaching them that this grace is not enough, that you need to be doing this or you need to be doing that and, and uh, you need to be 
looking to angels, and, and, and there are all kinds of things. And again, the scholars, they, they speculate all over the field on what we're talking about. And, and again, Paul is saying, don't look at those things. Focus on Jesus. Focus where your faith was originally placed. On the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. The free gift of God's love to us. That, that which changes us in ways we cannot change ourselves. We can strive to change and then suddenly we'll do something and we'll go, well, I really blew it that time. What kind of a Christian are you? Well, if your hope is in something other than the grace of God through Christ, then you're, you're at best nominally a Christian because you've put your hope in your ability to live that moral life that becomes a compass to everyone else. You've lost your focus on Jesus and on the grace that is ours through Christ. This is what Paul keeps focusing on. He's not going to lose sight of the central point. Anything else compromises salvation by grace. Any other claim leads us to a false hope leads us to again trust ourselves instead of Christ. And so when we read the letter, this is what we're seeing. What does this mean? How, you know, do we ever see this played out in life? Yes, we do in, in people's lives. But I may have shared something about this. Years ago, I toured uh, a Federal Reserve Bank, and one of the questions that was asked, how do you teach employees to recognize counterfeit bills? Counterfeiting has been a problem since there's been paper money. How do you teach employees to recognize counterfeit bills? The person leading the tour said, we don't really teach them to recognize counterfeit bills. We get them handling money. And the more they handle money, the more they recognize what it is. So that if you slip a counterfeit bill in there and they're counting, counting money, counting those bills, they flip the counterfeit out because it doesn't feel right. They know it's wrong because they have spent so much time with the real thing, with the genuine thing, that immediately they recognize the counterfeit and reject it. This is the way we are to be in our Christian life. We are to be so laser focused on Christ as we live life and it doesn't take us away from the life we live, but it means that we are, we are listening to what Paul is saying, that your hope, your faith, your love is all the result of the grace you have received in Christ, nothing else. We focus on Christ so that when something comes along that, <coughs> that is false, like someone who has learned to recognize genuine Uncle Sam currency, when the counterfeit is, is, in, is put in there, they just reject it. But we cannot do that in our life if we are not listening, if we're not focusing on Christ. I would invite you when you read Colossians, read it with those eyes. Read it with the eyes that, that are seeing this as Paul reminding us to keep our focus on Christ. Don't get caught up in the problems. Look for the solution. Always look for the solution. And when you do, you end up being like Paul, encouraging others and praying for them, giving thanks 
for the witness that they have, for the light that they have received, for what they, the faith that they, they learned and that they know, that then becomes more a part of their life as it is a part of yours and mine. Let us encourage each other. Let us help each other to keep our focus on the source, on the solution, who is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, there are plenty of problems in the world. You have given the answer to the deepest, to the deepest problem of all. To help us to find reason and purpose in life. Help us always to keep our eyes upon Jesus, who is the one who gave that sacrifice on our behalf, who is the one that brings us back to you, our creator. Thank you. Amen.